Great. So today we have Mari Volgma from The Moving Canine, um, who has come to talk to me all about movement puzzles. And I am I'm fascinated about this topic um, because it has so many applications. So welcome, Mari, and thank you for joining me. Hello, and thank you so much for inviting me. I'm always super excited to talk about movement puzzles because, as you know, like every single time we talk about them, we always discover like new ways we can use yeah. them and the new benefits. So it's uh, it's uh, really cool. So thank you for having me here. Thank you. Okay, so let's just start with a little bit of what are movement puzzles, just for people that maybe haven't heard of them before, and then we'll mm -hmm. dig a little bit deeper into applications, maybe. Okay, so um, I'm a certified professional canine fitness trainer, and movement puzzles actually started as a fitness training tool. Um, so they are exercises where we set up small physical challenges for our dogs, and our dogs then independently solve these challenges and move uh, through like a kind of an obstacle course, and they do it all on their own. We don't use any handler cues. Uh, and we build, so the exercises all start with um, simple two bowl game patterns. So our dogs get used to moving between two bowls. And then we start adding these obstacles between the two bowls. So it's all about like the dogs uh, doing the exercises independently and moving through a sequence of small physical challenges. So that's what movement puzzles are originally um, about. Uh, and since I created movement puzzles, we've discovered so many different uses so that uh, the element of uh, physical challenges still remains as part of the, the idea of movement puzzles. But we can actually use these exercises not only to boost our dog's fitness level and coordination while they are moving, but we can actually use these exercises to build confidence for moving through funny things. Uh, to build their independent skills because all these exercises the dog is working independently and we can make them bigger or smaller wh whatever our needs are so there are loads of um, different uses for movement puzzles fantastic so I've been thinking a lot about um, <laughs> movement puzzles um, I, I'm sure that people can hear in the background my puppy um, squeaking because she's just been put down for a nap she's a little bit overtired um, so one of the things I was going to introduce her to was different um, surfaces and mm -hmm. things like that. So I thought what a lovely way to introduce to a young dog um, within a pattern of walking over different surfaces as well. Um, so obviously we need to start off with you mentioned the two bowl game. Mm -hmm. So can you just describe for people that um, maybe can't picture it what it looks like? Um, I can obviously I've seen your videos and um, uh, parts of the movement puzzles, but how the dog can then go from one bowl to the other and then you can add things in so that they can do like a, a circuit as such. Mm -hmm. um, so the two bowl game um, and I apologize because all of the things that we are going to talk about, they are a lot easier to imagine once you've seen some videos, but I will do my best to try and describe them. So the two bowl game. Uh, basically uh, is an exercise where the dog learns the pattern of moving from one bowl to another. So when the dog um, gets a treat from one bowl, finishes eating the treat, then automatically the idea is like, okay, now I need to move to the next bowl uh, and I will get the treat from there. When the treat is eaten, the dog again is like going back to the first bowl. So the bo dog basically moves between two bowls. <clears throat> and uh, uh, in most uh, movement puzzles, the bowls are close to us so that we it's easy for us to deliver the treats. And then uh, once the dog knows the pattern of moving from one bowl to another, we can add some small exercises between the bowls. So the first one that we usually do is add a cone. So instead of moving directly from one bowl to another, the dog is then uh, moving around the cone to get to the next bowl then finishes eating the treat, then moves around the cone again uh, to the next bowl, uh, finish, eat, eats a treat from that bowl, and then uh, back around the cone. And gradually we can increase the distance uh, from, from the bowls to the cone 
and also we can add more cones and we can add other exercises instead of cones or uh, in addition to cones and um, yeah, it's a, it's a very flexible system but the key is that we build a pattern where the dog knows that it's all about uh, moving from one bowl to another and then doing things between these two bowls. Great I love that as well because patterns obviously are used <clears throat> excuse me within dog training um, so much to build confidence in dogs that are nervous or anxious or fearful um, and they give that predictability don't they in training yes and actually yesterday I was just like thinking that why are patterns so powerful when teaching these games because um, so sometimes it happens that the, during this exercise when the dog is moving from one bowl to another then something happens that disrupts that pattern so, for example, the dogs, uh, you uh, maybe you drop a treat next to the bowl and the dog starts looking for that treat. So in addition to getting a treat from the bowl, then the pattern is disruptive because the dog is like, oh, I need to sniff where that other treat is. And uh, when we do movement puzzles and longer sequences of exercises, then disrupting that pattern always leads to mistakes. So after there has been this disruption, then um, it's almost like, 100% sure that the next repetition after that mistake, not mistake, but the disruption, it uh, it won't be like the perfect solution, but there will be mistakes. And so yesterday I was just like looking into patterns and how they link to learning. And it actually com comes out that uh, patterns also um, improve learning speed so that the individuals who learn in patterns, they actually learn new skills faster and they are able to remember mm -hmm, um, the new things better when it's in a pattern. So for example, I was just thinking that that's why in movement puzzles, whenever you disrupt that pattern, like um, in any way, then you will get mistakes. It looks like your dog doesn't remember the exercise at all. It's like, I'm doing this for the first time. What do you mean? I just did it five times in a row. <laughs> yeah. So as soon as you start interrupting that pattern, uh, then you start getting problems in the training. And it's super fascinating how learning in patterns actually improves like the learning speed um, and also memory and remembering what you were working on, which is really cool, I think. Yeah, there's, there's so much to movement puzzles. Um, so many layers, isn't I, there? There are. And, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking my little brain's going here, there and everywhere, because as you say, you originally put it together from a fitness point of view. And now you're finding so many more applications. So yes. And actually, like all of these other applications have become more important than the fitness side of things. Yeah. So. Yeah. Which, again, is fascinating, isn't it? It's it's lovely to see things develop like that. And the byproducts. <laughs> Uh, almost now bigger than what it was set out for in the first place that is true which is yeah. I think it's just super cool and that's value to the idea plus as it's like they are still small physical challenges I think that also uh, because it's so exciting movement puzzles are fun to do they are um, like um almost like backyard agility or parkour courses that are taught slightly differently from parkour or agility but uh, because these are uh, quite fun activities, then I'm hoping that also more dogs uh, will get like physically more active by doing like aiming to get all these other benefits. They are doing physical exercises, which um, is also very helpful for like long um, or good quality life for longer. Yeah. And also the mental side of it as well, because they're having to think as they do it. Um, so it, it is that perfect sort of mental and physical um, exercise, isn't it? So um, yes, and it's thought that if you go like a physical exercise has its own benefits anyway, but it's thought that if you combine this learning plus um, physical exercise, then it's more powerful and it has more benefits. Yeah, so. fantastic. So um, obviously I mentioned that I was, uh, my plan is to start this with the puppy um, and have her going over different surfaces doing it. But um, obviously I've got multiple dogs. Um, and so Ding, my, he's six now, my six-year-old border collie, he loves novelty and he mm -hmm. loves doing new things. And that is really enriching to him. So 
asking him to do a pattern, but including different obstacles for him would be really fun and mm -hmm. a great exercise to do. Um, and then I was also thinking about it in relation to um, Bo, my youngest, who, well, my youngest, obviously now I have Poppy, I'm getting confused, my two-year-old um, Border Collie, who he's still adolescent, his legs go everywhere, um, mm -hmm. he needs to improve his balance. So actually doing something like this is a little bit more thoughtful um, or can help him to be a bit more thoughtful about where his feet go. Um, whereas in agility, he's he's very fast. So this is great for giving him something different, but to think about where his feet are mm -hmm. as well. So um, those are just some of the things that I'm finding with my own dogs. And actually, like, that's how Movement Puzzle started. Um, um, it was because uh, my own youngest dog, Mr. Bo, he's a very powerful and intense dog who is like, every, let's do everything super fast. I can run. I like to, like, rush into things. And I noticed that when I was doing, like, foundation agility exercises with him, then he was struggling with tight left turns. So whenever there was a... Um, wrapping around the jump wing or a uh, weave pole entry where he had to go like with a tight left turn then he would start vocalizing and I could see his like arousal going up and he's he was getting frustrated a bit he was still doing it because he was like oh I need to go like and do stuff obviously <clears throat> And then when I looked at the video, I noticed that, that he, whenever he was doing a tight left turn, his um, uh, left um, hind foot was slipping a little bit. And um, that's when I'm, as a fitness trainer, uh, for me, every training problem starts with fitness exercises. So for me, it was like, ah, oh, so he must be having trouble controlling his body during these tight left turns and moving in a way that he wouldn't slip because slipping, it's a negative sensation. It's almost like using punishment in your training because it's like, like no one wants to slip. Yeah. Like if we slip, then it's like, oh, it's something that we actually want to avoid because it's it's not a nice sensation at all so no wonder that boss like frustration was going up and he was like vocalizing and saying that it's not cool but i will keep going yeah <laughs> and the very first movement puzzles were exercises where i was thinking that mm, how can i create an environment where he can like focus on his foot placement in a like calm mindset that he wasn't focused about like I want to get my toy or we need to run really fast or like what I'm doing as a handler. So the first movement puzzle was basically an exercise where the two ball game, because that allowed me to remove myself from the equation without like giving Bo any uh, clues. And it was about Bo moving around the cone and uh, like having small uh, coordination challenges behind the cone. For example, like mo uh, stepping over poles where he had to focus how he's going to place his paws behind the cone. And it was super fascinating to see because it was just an experiment. It was my uh, like idea that maybe Bo is just struggling with his foot placement uh, when going around the turn. And like after two or three sessions of working on his foot placement around the cone where he could actually focus on what he was doing and figure out how he can use his body in that situation, his uh, problem with le tight left turns were gone. It was like, yeah, I know this. It's fine. Uh, we can move on now. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And again, um, I know before we um, started to record this, we were talking about a couple of things about um, teaching dogs to go out and then come back. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously in our behavior training that we do with a dog, sometimes they'll go out as in towards a trigger and then they get stuck and they can't turn back. Um, and so I know before we were talking about like the pattern helping teach that but also now that you've said that it sort of triggered something else in my brain of if it is more difficult for a dog to turn left or right because like us they're all handed um then if the handler is asking them to orient back away from the trigger to their difficult side mm -hmm. then that's more difficult as well so even with things like that the movement puzzles where they go 
um, in both directions is also going to help to um, even them up physically as well, isn't it? So yes. there's another little light bulb that just um, <laughs> went off in my head there as well. Yeah, exactly. And like when we when I teach movement puzzles, then it's very common for dogs to be asymmetrical in their performance. But just by doing these exercises, the dogs learn to like use the weaker side more equal to their a stronger side and one of the things that or like comments that I often get is that like so why don't I just let my dog run off leash like in the forest like my dog is still using his body getting the physical workout also it builds like body awareness <clears throat> moving on an uneven terrain and it it's like beneficial to everyone and I don't argue with that at all but for example when we talk about this um asymmetric performance then in the forest your dog is going to do asymmetric performance yeah. and they are going to prefer their easier side for example with Bo's uh, tight left turns he didn't do it naturally at all so when he was running in the forest whenever he had to like do a tight turn he would choose like his easier side which is yeah. to the right which means that he would never get better to his left side and after I did this movement puzzle exercises with him, where he evened out the two sides, the left side is still weaker for him, but it's not that noticeable anymore. I noticed that he actually started doing tight left turns in the nature as well. So that actually like expanded his skill set for moving in the nature, which otherwise wouldn't have happened if I just counted on my dog running freely in the forest and then like fingers crossed yeah <laughs> they're going to learn the correct skill that I need for sport yeah fantastic so something else that um going back to my puppy um yep. we'll come uh, back <laughs> we keep talking about it's like puppy. movement puzzle we move away from your puppy and then we come and back. then back <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> As well as surfaces, um, with all of my puppies, even though this puppy is very brave, um, mm -hmm. I was going to also put in some like noise type exercises yeah. where she goes and makes noise as she goes through um, things as well. So not just for puppies, for, but for older dogs that might struggle with noise, confidence, all of those sorts of things. Things touching their bodies, for yeah. example. Yeah. That's so a very common one that my students get is that they say that their dog doesn't like things touching their body and we do have exercises or movement puzzle where the dog moves through things that touch their body so this is really cool to see when the dog who was previously cautious like I'm not going in there like we don't let that situation to happen at all where the dog can say or like where the dog would want to say that I'm not going to go in there yeah. but when the owner reports that previously my dog wouldn't have done this and then we do these exercises and the dog is like pushing through stuff like ah oh, yeah. I'm getting to the other side of this exercise because I don't care if things touch my body then it's really cool and it's not like it's not high impact ex exercise you can do it with puppies you can do it with dogs who have some physical limitations because like with the more difficult physical challenges you can't like maybe it's best not to do them with dogs who are older or maybe have some physical challenges but uh, you can definitely do uh, do this like pushing uh, through noisy stuff or like things touching the body and things like that or uh, even for example we had this exercise where there are two cardboard boxes close together and the dogs are just pushing through that like small gap it's not like high impact exercise and uh, dogs of all ages and uh, physical capabilities can do these exercises yeah I love that so some dogs in agility that find um find the weaves a little bit disconcerting because of touching the weave poles so even taking it into that context would help that sort of thing. Um, yes. And I know that before you mentioned about um, scent work as well, um, how it can help to improve their confidence of finding the hides in more tricky places. Um, do you want to just expand on that as well? Because that's, again, it's it's something that you wouldn't necessarily think of the two things coming together, but people are finding yeah. it's really helping. Uh, so uh, in in the movement puzzles course, we have a lot of people who do scent work as well. I personally haven't done it because in our country, it's it's not like an option. Uh, basically, we don't do like scent work unless you teach it on your own, but you don't have any events to go to. <clears throat> 
And uh, so the movement fossil students who do scent work have uh, just recently I've, re I've received uh, several messages from our students who are saying that their previously cautious dog wouldn't go into these tight spaces or crawl under, for example, a chair to find a height or uh, going through um, a zones where the dog has to like go through a, like a narrow area that is like high walls, basically, that their dogs are a lot more confident going into these areas to find them um, uh, containers. I don't know exactly about the rules of nose work, but they say that their dogs are also um, mm, more eager to interact with containers. Now, I'm not sure if like even some, uh, I think some, um, titling organizations probably don't allow that but like if they do then dogs are more bolder to like um interact with different objects to like get to the um scent if they need to which is super cool it is it certainly is because a lot of people doing scent work um with nervous or reactive dogs because it is a popular um activity for these dogs yeah. isn't it yeah yeah because it's cal calming um, yeah. And using the nose and the dog's natural ability to like find stuff, then yeah. Yeah. So I don't know how to say this. It's quite often when we talk about um an activity, a type of training, it's much more um channeled to one age of dog or activity or something like that. Whereas movement puzzles really does help. <laughs> everyone <laughs> um and can be used by everyone for their dogs because it can be adapted can't it to puppy level to anxious dogs or to sport dogs um and you can make the challenges within the movement puzzle to the level of the dog that you've got yeah and the uh, area that you have available for training yes. because like for example with the bigger puzzles so you can actually make them really big once the dog knows the pattern then uh, so one of our stu uh, like older students she uh, she has some um, like maybe 10 meter radius so I'm not now sure how many feet that it is is it like 30 feet or yes, something yes. Yeah. Is it, am I getting it right yeah. anyway 10 meters or something which is quite a long distance for the dog go, to go and work independently but you can also make them in your living room you you don't have to like make it so big you can make it in your living room uh, and you can uh, also uh, people often get stuck behind the idea that you need some kind of special equipment special equipment does make it a little bit easier for you to set up the exercises However, you can actually use the furniture in your house to make these exercises happen. Um, just uh, kind of have to be open to the idea of using your furniture for your dog yeah. exercises. But um, so one of our students, for example, when we were just doing this exercise of pushing through like a, a gap between two cardboard boxes, she didn't have a box available to her. So she had a really massive balloon so it was like like human height balloon that was standing on the floor and then a chair and the dog was moving be between like the bo uh, balloon and the chair so it's not something that I would encourage with a dog who was scared of the balloon obviously but it was like she just used this um, the things available to her to create this narrow space that her dog can uh, like walk through fantastic that's so you, you do need to be creative for these so but you can make them work but that can be part of the fun of it can't it um find activity exercises for handlers to yes. solve the <laughs> to solve the challenge of like how am i going to make this happen now fantastic uh, it really has got so many applications and i know that we could talk about all of the applications for a long time because even the like we said the going out independently and coming back in a loop um even that if you think about recall you know your dog is coming back mm. to you um turning away from triggers for reactive dogs because and as i understand yeah. for uh many like um, hunting breeds and uh, this kind of breeds who are more used or happier uh, moving away from the handler and going like out on their own then returning to the handler on the other side as it's part of the exercise 
Mm, so I haven't experienced it myself, but I understand from people that like this kind of pattern uh, of moving away and then coming back to you um, is um, is a really nice uh, training option for them as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's sort of the the knock on effect, if you like, um, which the exercise wasn't necessarily set out as a recall exercise or anything like that, but it can have that then um, knock on effect into the training. So that's fantastic. So for everybody who would like to find out more, um, Mari is running a challenge. Um, is it a free training Um what date does it start on? Because I haven't got the date written down here. Uh, it starts on Monday, so July Monday. 31st. So, uh, for, And for a f- full week, we are going to talk about, we are going to take a lot deeper dive into what movement puzzles are, how they got started, how you can use them for fitness training. But mostly we will be talking about um, uh, confidence building and using why movement puzzles are so powerful when building our dog's confidence. And we will be talking about mental benefits and um, benefits with uh, behavior challenges as well, because it has come out that they can help help there as well. Fantastic. And uh, there will be some exercises as well so that you can get started with your first movement puzzle. Fantastic. I will drop the link for anybody that wants to join um, beneath this video. Um, And I hope everybody has fun creating some new movement patterns with their dog and please and using do. furniture and other stuff in your <laughs> living room or making these exercises happen yes definitely get inventive about what you can send your dog around over under between <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> fantastic okay so let's have a little chat about movement puzzles in relation to obviously border collies so yeah more movement puzzle fun <laughs> So obviously border collies like to move. So mm-hmm. and movement puzzles are great for them. Uh they like to work at distance from the yep. handler. So they can in movement puzzles, they don't have to stay near the handler at all. They can just like go and do the exercise that is further away. Yeah. Which is I think many of them probably enjoy it quite a lot. Yeah, we really have to work on proximity with our border collies. So teach and them it's, to move and then come back. Yeah. and uh, like uh, in uh, in their context for example it's uh, the, them getting close to you and get, getting that treat is then reinforced by the opportunity to move away yes. again yes absolutely <laughs> which Love makes that. that pattern work for them probably yeah but it also makes it work for us as the handler as well doesn't it because the dog's getting what they want and we're getting what we want yeah exactly so, there's no yeah. conflict there at all yeah love that um also they get a little dopamine hit uh, (laughs) not just a little (laughs) because like as you know like love it (laughs) it's like uh movement and physical exercise releases dopamine then patterns release dopamine um gosh now i'm forgetting like there was another element about movement puzzles that release dopamine It will come back to me. Anyway, there are so so many different levels of movement puzzle that release dopamine for the... Novelty releases dopamine. Yeah, novelty, (laughs) yeah. And anticipation of reward as well. So if they're going around a loop of of, a movement loop and they know that they're getting nearer back to the bowl and the anticipation of the reward as well, the anticipation of the release to go back and move again. Yeah. But about rewards, it's um, <clears throat> something that is, uh, now this is like quite a deep discussion, but for example, as you know, with movement puzzles, we don't blur the exercises we do, and we don't create situations where our dogs only get reinforcement by doing the correct thing. So the key of movement puzzles is that obviously we don't want the incorrect answers to the exercise. So uh, we just are very, very careful about how we set up the exercise so that the correct choice is also the most likely one for the dog to do. And then when mistakes start happening, then we look into this, like, why did the dog choose to, like, um, move in a different different way during the exercise? So the common mistake is, for example, moving around props that we've used. Let's say 
uh, we are using like two boxes and we want our dog to go between two boxes. And then during uh, some of the reps, the dog chooses to go around the boxes instead of going between them. Um, and I think that in movement puzzles, one of the very important things is that because we are we really split up all the exercises, it, and it doesn't mean that the training process will be a lot longer. We are just very clever and very good at splitting them. Um, then um, the dog, um, they are reinforced for the incorrect behaviors as well, but the uh, uh, amount of the correct behaviors is a lot higher than the incorrect ones. And uh, because of that, then they get, because they get reinforced with them uh, for all this uh, engagement with the different props, then obviously we are already building this reinforcement into these props as well, which is why we can actually like make puzzles so big is because like our dogs know that or they have this history that this prop or this exercise uh, if I do it like this way I will get like it's reinforcing for me to do it this way because it has such a long history of reinforcement linked to it so it's not only that the dog is finding like oh I will do this super long sequence so that I can get like one uh, dry yeah, yeah. kibble but it's actually like the way that we uh, layer these movement puzzles and how we build them it makes the exercise itself reinforcing and the activity itself like a fun thing to do because it it's just like all the parts have been reinforced and the dog knows that they're actually like if they choose or for some reason not to do the exercise then it won't be ignored and it, like getting or doing only the correct thing isn't the only way to get the reinforcement but they choose to do the correct thing because it's like oh I want to do this it's fun I like it yeah. And if you think about um, working sheep, they're not really rewarded with food or toys. It's the work exactly. itself that's... The, the activity itself is reinforcing. And I think that in movement puzzles, it, like when done correctly, then you can... It's I'm not comparing it to working sheep or like doing uh, the natural work of the dog, but I think that the exercise itself becomes reinforcing because of the way that we teach it. Yeah. No, definitely. And the same can be said for any sport that we do with our Border Collies, because, you know, if you're doing 20 obstacles on an agility course, you can't reward after each one. Um, yeah. so then gradually they start to love doing the equipment. Um, so then that becomes as rewarding as then the reward that they still get at the end as well. So, yeah. Like, uh, tunnel vision. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Tunnel, I need to get in there. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Spends longer to take it, teach your dog not to go in a tunnel than it does to actually go in a tunnel. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah, lots of applications for border collies. Um and <clears throat> uh, as I understand, and with border collies also it's quite quite common that they don't like to be touched, which yeah. is like it's so obviously it's fine. But for example, in movement buses, um, because there are exercises that where it, like by you don't have to touch your dog but like you can set up the environment so that there is something touching the dog's body then it may also help with the dog becoming more comfortable about things touching their body while they are working for example so that they um uh, wouldn't get worried about it and as you mentioned i think that we mentioned it before the weave poles for example uh, yeah, um, yeah the weave poles touching the body yeah um the other thing as well, so Bo, my youngster, he's um, he's actually his very cuddly dog, like on the sofa, he'll really snuggle into you. But when he's on the start line for agility, he doesn't want you to stroke him. He's like, oh, no, I'm working now. So, you know, having that touch and contact of things when he's working can help to, you know, um, make him feel better about that. Yeah, exactly. So that at least they, like, may, they may not still like it necessarily, but it's like uh, it's mm -hmm. not that freaky anymore or yeah. strange or yeah. something plus um one of the really powerful things especially if you have a dog who generally doesn't like touching at all so not just like during working but um, some dogs just don't like like touching or like maybe even just like uh, only humans touching them and so on but touch itself is a very powerful way of uh, um, building body awareness and becoming aware of 
your body and size. And for example, when we do just paw target exercises, that is a very common exercise for body awareness. You place paws onto like smaller targets, so you learn where the paws are. Uh, but one of the elements that I think is often ignored is using touch. And here I don't mean like that you have to poke your dog, obviously like massage and uh, other uh, touching um, um, options are a great way to improve body awareness but for example if you can structure a movement puzzle exercise that includes this touch part then that already tells the dog where his body is while moving not just pause yeah. but where my back is where my body ends with respect to the environment it's like uh, you finally learn how to move with that um, back trailer or something you know <laughs> For most of uh, human drivers, it's quite challenging to learn driving with a trailer and backing up with a tra trailer. So that's our dogs. They have trailers behind their front feet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and getting that uh, like touch sensory feedback gives them a lot of valuable information of like how big they are and where every part of their body is and so on. Yeah. yeah. So that's super yeah. fascinating. Love it. And can we just touch as well? I know that we've um, spoken briefly about this um, off screen um, as such, but um, about uh, Border Collies repeating things, because when they're bred to um, herd, obviously, they repeat all day long and more so than some other dogs. Um, <clears throat> but also um, the fact that you found that maybe the mechanics of the handler doesn't need to be quite so spot on with a border collie because their love of work and doing the activity. Um, the pattern that they've yeah. just learned, like, oh, there's a pattern, like, I know. Yeah, so I can come and do this, and actually you're not, they're still obviously working with you, but independently of you, which is what they're bred to do. Um, so could you just talk into that a little bit, because I think that's fascinating. Okay, so yeah, it's um so in movement puzzles and like everything that I teach, I tur like I pay a lot of attention to handler mechanics, so that your marking is good, that your own uh, hand movement of delivering the reinforcement is separate from your marker, so that it's not like your hand is already delivering the treat and then you say like yes somewhere in the middle of the movement, but it's like you say yes. And then you start delivering the treat, for example. Uh, and um, in my courses, we pay a lot of attention to this because for very many dogs, it matters a lot how that if we, if we are using messy handler mechanics, let's say we start delivering delivering the treat in the bowl, and then say uh, like the marker word to our dog then very many dogs they uh, they can't focus on the exercise they start looking at the handler to see like that hand movement that uh, predicts the deliver of the reinforcement because the word isn't reliable but uh, what i've noticed with our students is that with very many border collies you can be a lot messier with your mechanics than other uh, dog owners and you will get away with it the dog is uh, just like um, uh, learning the pattern really quickly and then they just don't care what your mechanics is doing because they are like I know the pattern I'm just like going uh, between these two bowls to the exercise and yeah yeah you can do whatever you want <laughs> <laughs> it's it, so obviously it's not like 100% true there are always like dogs on border collies who do need that very clear handler mechanics because there are all, all, there are all, also border collies who start looking at the handler very strongly if the handler mechanics is not uh, like tidy yeah, but yeah. for uh, like big part of them the handler mechanics doesn't seem to be that important so the handlers can get away with a lot of a lot less of me telling them how to fix their mechanics because it doesn't affect the dog, dog's performance I love that. And, you know, we're not encouraging people to be messy trainers, but it was just a really interesting observation of their work ethic. Um, yeah. It's, um... And here I just want to clarify that it's not any, it doesn't have anything to do with like other dogs being maybe more stupid or anything. I don't mean that at all. It's just like for different dogs, different things matter. And with different dogs, you have to be like very mindful about different um, elements. <clears throat> that you will like 
that you are working on. So it, it's just like an observation that the handler can be mess, messier with protocols. It's not necessarily a good thing because that means that the handler is missing out on the coordination exercise benefits because handler mechanics is coordination exercise for the handler. Yeah. So uh, let's just say that with other breeds, the handler gets more benefits. <laughs> I <laughs> love that. <laughs> From the coordination side of things. And as we know, coordination is really beneficial for brain health. So these handlers are actually very happy that they have to work on the, their own coordination. Yeah. Like and border collie owners. Another border collie that isn't as, um, you know, it tuned in like that, then you can struggle, can't you? So yeah, we exactly. are always aiming to make our mechanics as clean as possible. Um, but yeah, a really interesting observation um with with their work let's say yeah it is uh it's, it's very funny <laughs> and then I try to I always think that I wonder if my students notice that I like in some cases I let them handle mechanic mistakes slip just because like the, it doesn't seem to affect the dog that much so I'm like well don't yeah, have yeah. to work on that yeah and in all fairness with with all the training that I do I work on the things that I need to work on um, so you know there's there's no need to add in more tasks because it will especially if there's no motivation like to do this more more tasks then there's no need to do that fantastic gotta love a border collie uh, i to be honest i love all, like all the dogs probably and different breeds they all bring something unique to the table and they they have very unique approaches to life yeah makes life interesting exactly <clears throat> great well thank you so much mari for joining me <clears throat> excuse me as i say i will drop the link for anybody who wants to um sign up to your free training next week um below this video thank you so much ev everyone for listening for watching and um, i hope that you also got excited about more movement puzzles and how they can help you and your dog Fantastic. Thank you.